Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Thank you for being with us here, whether it's online or in person. We are in a series on the Holy Spirit. And last week we had an introduction to the Holy Spirit meeting him. And uh, this week I want to talk to you about uh, maybe the uh, role of the Holy Spirit that you're not really familiar with as much um, that we may not think about often. And uh, before I get into that, um, I want you to know that I see, and I'm sure you see with me, the desperation of our world right now. Um, you have to be living under a rock to not know that the world's condition right now is not good. And it can be overwhelming, can it? But we learned that we praise God through it. And today you're going to hear that we, we push through and we help the world follow Jesus as well and believe in him and find hope in Christ. But here's the thing. How do we see the world change for Jesus? How, how do we see the world who doesn't see their need for Jesus? How does that take place? How, how do we help our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers see their need for Jesus, well, I have good news for you today. The Holy Spirit helps us do that. The Holy Spirit is going to help you help your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers, your community know Christ. When I, when I see the desperation and the spiritual condition of our world, I go, oh, Lord, it's only by your grace that this is going to change. And so today I'm praying that this message would uh, equip you, inspire, encourage you. Uh, here's what we do know from Scripture is that, as we learned last week, the Holy Spirit, God, and Jesus are in his fellowship. And so God cares about the lost and sinners and unbelievers. He cares about them, so, so would the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is wanting people to be saved, and he's working to make that happen. And we do know this, that the Holy Spirit does not live or dwell in an unbeliever, but the Holy Spirit will come upon an unbeliever to work in them to believe. And that's what I'm going to bring to us today. I don't know if we've ever preached this message, at least that I can remember that we preached on this scripture before. So this is a brand new message, fresh word and fresh bread for us today. Now, the condition of humanity without the Holy Spirit is concerning. I want to read to you some scriptures, and they'll be on the screen as well. The condition of humanity without the Holy Spirit, and this is why the Holy Spirit cares about humanity and wanting them to be saved. And the title of my sermon is The Spirit and the Sinner, and the Spirit's work in the sinner and the unbeliever. John 14, 17 says, He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. Isn't that concerning? The world can't receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But this is what Jesus tells his disciples. But you know him because he lives with you now. He's talking about himself and the Holy Spirit working with him. And later he will be in you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit coming after Pentecost and pouring into people and, and also as well as in faith in Christ and in Pentecost living among you. So we see that the world cannot receive him because it's not looking for him and doesn't even recognize him. What about Ephesians 2, 1 through 2? It says this, Once you were dead, spiritually dead, because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. That's a bad place to be. It's not a good place to be that you are so lost and far from God. And that's someone who does not have the Holy Spirit in them to help them. And God changes all that in the later verses through Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. Ephesians 4.18 Here's another scripture about those who are lost. It says, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they close their minds and harden their hearts against him. How do we reach the world whose hearts have hardened against him? 
How do we see them change? I can tell you in this sermon, I'm going to tell you now, I'm, going to, I'm probably going to say it multiple times, it's not by any of our ability of convincing someone. It's not. I, I, my wife and I get in some pretty good debates. I can get in some pretty good arguments and defend the faith, but no matter what I do to defend God or defend my own cause, I rarely persuade people to believe through my arguing. We need the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. Those who do not have the Spirit cannot receive the truth from God's Spirit. This is what it, it sounds all foolish to them, uh, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual or who have the Spirit in them can understand what the Spirit means. That is a dangerous place to be. They can't understand it without the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Does that sound like our world today? It's concerning, isn't it? All those references have to do with the Holy Spirit is not present in those people's lives. So what would happen if the Holy Spirit comes in? Well, something amazing. The Spirit is spiritual life for a believer. So an unbeliever without the Spirit is considered spiritually dead or unable to participate in fellowship with God. They cannot receive nor understand spiritual things from God without the Spirit. An unbeliever doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit, isn't even looking for him. Without the Spirit of God, you are lost in many ways. A person without salvation and new life through the Holy Spirit is destined to receive God's judgment of hell and eternal separation from him. That is the destiny of those who do not have the Holy Spirit in them, the presence of God in Jesus Christ. For me, my heart breaks for that in our world right now because they are having a hard time even seeing their sin and their need for Jesus. And we may get mad as Christians and a little, little self-righteous at times and go, why aren't they? You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You're right, but they're not awake to Jesus yet. I agree, but they don't know. They don't get it. They haven't seen their error in their ways. And it's because no matter what we say or do, it's not sinking in. Well, that means we need some help, right? There is hope because 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, for God, just two verses later from where the devil is blinding unbelievers, two verses later, Paul says, for God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what we need we need the light of Christ to shine. And how does that light enter into someone's heart? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here to convince humanity of its sinful condition and to trust in Jesus for salvation. Maybe we didn't realize that, but let me back that up with Scripture. That's important, right? Let's go to John chapter 16, 5 through 11. We started with the first few verses last week, and we're going to finish with the rest of those in this paragraph. John 16, 5 through 11. It says this, but now I'm going away to the one who sent me. Again, just context here. Jesus is with his disciples before he goes to the cross, and then he would also ascend and leave them here on the earth, but he wouldn't leave them alone. I'm going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking, where am I going? Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate or the Holy Spirit won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, what will he do? Here's what verse 8 says. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness 
and of the coming judgment. Well, there you have it. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. And judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. He's talking about Satan. What does this scripture mean? What is he saying here? Well, first of all, it can be interpreted, uh, the word convict can be interpreted convince. E.A. Bloom explains this. He says, to present or expose facts, to convince of the truth. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He will convict, he will move in someone's heart and help them see and convince them of their sin and their need for Jesus. The Spirit works on the minds of the unsaved to show them the truth of God for what or who he is. So let's deal with the three things that he does. The first one, the Holy Spirit convinces the world of its sin. The, greater, the greatest sin that we see in this paragraph, Jesus says it, is the failure to believe in Jesus. Of all the sins that someone could commit, if you don't believe in Jesus and you don't believe his message, then you don't believe that you're a sinner. Because Jesus came in and said we are full of sin and that we must be saved from our sin. This rejection is due to a failure to admit one's sinful condition and believe in Jesus to save and transform. Why would someone not be able to see their sinful condition? Well, let me tell you something. Sin is very deceitful. And sin causes so much pride in your life that you are blind to your own sin and your own error of ways. And so the Holy Spirit has to come in and convict this person to help them see that they are not right. They're not in good place with God. And so the Holy Spirit will begin to work in them. Now, I want to read a long paragraph to you by D.A. Carson, a theologian who comments on this scripture. I think it's very valuable. It's on, the, on our website, calvarydover.org forward slash grow. He says this, he convicts the world of its sin because the people who constitute the world do not believe in Jesus. If they did believe in Jesus, they would believe his statements about their guilt and turn to him. As it is, their unbelief brings not only condemnation, according to John 3, 18 and 36, but also willful ignorance of their need. The world's unbelief not only ensures that it will not, that it will not receive life, it ensures that it cannot perceive that it walks in death and needs life. There are people who cannot see that they're walking in a destiny of death. Isn't that scary? That, as a Christian and as a pastor and as a friend for my neighbors, I'm concerned because they're so lost, they don't even realize it. And it reminds me of Jesus' heart on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. That should be our attitude postured towards the lost is they don't even realize how lost they are. That was Jonah's heart, or that wasn't Jonah's heart, that was God's heart in the book of Jonah. Remember that in our series? God was like, they're so lost, they don't know their left hand from their right hand. He was explaining their spiritual darkness. That's how lost, and, and God was trying to get Jonah to see how lost they were and how much God loves them. But he ends this paragraph by saying this, this convicting work of the paraclete, which is the Greek word for Holy Spirit, is therefore gracious. It is designed to men and women of the wor world to recognize their need and so turn to Jesus and thus stop being the world. Did you catch that? That the work of the Holy Spirit to convict someone of their sin is a gracious act of God. The word conviction isn't a bad word. It's a good word. That changes the way you pray, doesn't it? When you're mad at someone, you're not, God, convict them or help them to see their guilt. Help my neighbor to see that they, the way they're treating my yard. No, that's not the attitude or posture of the Holy Spirit at all in this situation. The Holy Spirit is concerned that these people are going to hell without Jesus. And so he's like, let me help them see their need because they need my help. That's the heart here. He's so loving. God is so loving that he does expose the truth in your life 
so that you will see your need for Jesus. Secondly, the Holy Spirit convinces the world or convicts the world of God's righteousness. What does that mean? What Jesus indeed was right and humanity was wrong. He did no wrong and we crucified him. Mankind crucified him. Our sins crucified Jesus and he proved to be right because he overcame the grave and rose again, having power over death. He is holy and righteous and mankind is not unless we have Jesus. The unbeliever needs the Holy Spirit to convict or convince them in believing God is righteous and true. And at the same time, that means they're going to understand that they are wrong in their sins. Another way to look at this is that the need for the Holy Spirit to testify of God's righteousness and truth. So the Holy Spirit will testify to the hearts of an unbeliever that God is righteous and true and that you need him. But there's another thing that the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit helps us believe that we are righteous. There's a teaching in in theology that the righteousness of Christ is credited to us through faith in him. We're, We're in debt because of our sin. We're lost and there's no there's no ability, knowledge, any kind of good deeds that can make us righteous enough. But when we believe in Jesus, he gives us his righteousness, credits to our, so, so to say, account or our heart, and God sees us as righteous. You know how hard that can be to believe? That takes faith, doesn't it? It's by faith that we are made righteous, the Bible says. So the Holy Spirit will help you believe that as an unbeliever sinner who's turning to Christ. Once you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit will help you believe that you are forgiven and justified. And you know what? Even us Christians, we need that reminder, don't we? Sometimes we're just like, you know, maybe we've messed up or maybe we've heard so many lies about ourselves and we haven't heard the truth of God enough. We're still growing and the Holy Spirit will come in. By the way, it's so important that we know our word because the Holy Spirit works with the word to testify the truth to our hearts and our minds whenever we're starting to question our salvation But as believers, we need the Holy Spirit to remind us that we are forgiven and saved. Well, he does that for unbelievers too. He helps them see that you need the righteousness of Christ. That's amazing. And lastly, the third thing he does, the Holy Spirit convinces the world of the coming judgment. The other word that can be used here is the wrath of God on all those who are not believers and saved. That's the judgment that he's referring to here. The death and resurrection of Christ was a loss and a defeat for Satan. And a couple commentaries say these things. Jesus defeated the devil who held the power of death. Jesus defeated him. The devil held the power of death in Hebrews 2.14, but Jesus defeated him. How? Because he rose again. Though defeated at the cross, Satan is still active, according to 1 Peter 5, 8. But like a condemned criminal, his execution is coming soon. Judgment is coming. Now that is good news, I get it. But let me read the next part, okay? Because I agree with you. Thank God. He won't have any more power on earth to do anything he's doing. But secondly, ready for this? Here's the next part. People in rebellion should take note of Satan's defeat and fear the Lord who holds the power to judge. As the fact of coming judgment, both Satan's and man's is proclaimed. The spirit convicts people and prepares them for salvation because God wishes that none should perish but have everlasting life. It's not a bad thing if you're feeling convicted by the Holy Spirit. It's a good thing. It's the grace and love of God. And even today while I'm preaching, the Holy Spirit may begin to convict you on things. I know he is. 
And maybe he's also trying to convince you that you are loved. I know he is. And he's also trying to convince you and remind you that his judgment is coming. I know he will. God cares way too much for all of you and for me to stay quiet. His spirit is speaking to us today. Get ready. I'm coming. I'm coming. And I've been convicting you because I love you and I want you ready. I want you ready because I love you. So let's talk about that because it seems like the Holy Spirit cares about sinners, but why aren't so many people turning to God? Is the Holy Spirit ineffective? Is he not powerful enough over sin and death? Well, of course he is because he's the one that rose Christ from the dead. But you know what? God is a gentleman and he allows us to respond to his spirit. We have free will. And so the, the need is that, that people need to respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction and awareness of their sin. Only when the Holy Spirit moves upon them, being unbelieving sinners, can they become aware of their spiritual need. They must then decide whether to continue in their sinful state or to respond positively to the voice of the Spirit. Anthony Palma, one of our theological seminary professors in the Assemblies of God, it's so true that the Holy Spirit will work, but it's up to mankind to respond to that conviction and to respond to that awareness. There's examples in Scripture. I don't have ton, a ton of time to read them because the stories are actually pretty long. But in Acts 2, Peter was there at the church when the church, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church in a mighty, powerful way, baptizing them in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm looking forward to teaching on that. Uh, in the coming series, but he was so full of the Spirit that he went out and just preached the good news of Jesus. He, he preached what he heard from Jesus and from the prophets. He just, he just, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't rehearse. He didn't memorize it. He didn't have a cool illustration with it. He didn't have a human video with it. No dramas, no skits. He just told them, and the Holy Spirit moved powerfully, and this is what it says in Scripture it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Because they wanted to be saved. He didn't, he didn't do a song and a dance and, and impress them. He just told them what the Bible says. And the Holy Spirit took that and over 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus that day. That is being full of the Holy Spirit that's being the Spirit of God working through that message. Now you go a few pages over, and Stephen also is said to be full of the Holy Spirit, but things don't go well in that situation. He preaches a strong word against the Pharisees and the Jews who were accusing him of lying and blasphemy and all these other things. And he's preaching this message. It's one of the longest sermons that you'll read in the Bible, but it's powerful. He goes in the, if you want to know what the story of the Bible is in one chapter, go to Acts 7. Stephen does an amazing, they were impressed by his knowledge and understanding of the word of God because he wasn't even a Pharisee. He didn't study the scripture his whole life. The Holy Spirit was speaking through him. Be you ready for this? They stoned him. How is that possible? They both were full of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was working among the gospel being preached. The words of Scripture is because mankind can reject the Holy Spirit. And he was murdered. But it was in one place in Scripture where God stood up on his throne watching his servant being stoned. Beautiful. And then we have Acts 17 where Paul also preaches a strong message and a powerful message of what the gospel is all about. And his response in the audience was some laughed and mocked him and then some believed. So I like that story in particular too because you know what we need to do? We need a partner with the Holy Spirit. That's where we're headed next. You see what happened here? The Holy Spirit works, but he works among us and with us. 
We partner with the Holy Spirit in our witnessing. And that's what they did. They shared their eyewitness testimonies, they shared scripture, and then they waited for the Holy Spirit to move and work. And you know, don't be discouraged. Some people will believe and some people won't. But don't let it stop us from testifying of the good news of Jesus. Is it really our role, Ryan? Yes. John 15, 26 through 27. Let's go to that. And we're also going to be in Romans 10. But John 15, 26 through 27 says this. And this is Jesus again saying, I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. He will come to you from the Father and will testify about me. Interesting. God will send, or Jesus will send the Holy Spirit, right? But the Holy Spirit will testify about Jesus. So God sent Jesus. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. They're all working together to do what? To help us. But he says this, and you must also testify or witness or share about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Okay, maybe you're like, well, Ryan, I'm not an apostle. I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. What am I supposed to share? Has Jesus changed your life? Absolutely. Do you believe in the truth of Jesus Christ here in life? Then you share it. Maybe you don't have a testimony like some others where they were in a gang and they were shot and they overcame drugs and all these other things and your testimony is like mine. I was raised in church and I wasn't really a really bad kid. I'll, I mean, I would have my issues. <laughs> but that's my testimony that God has the power to keep you from those things too. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The point is, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God, rose again and has the power to save because he saved your life then you have a testimony. You can share. But we should testify what Christ has done. You don't even have to use your testimony. You can testify that this is all true. Because it is. And we share scripture. We're so vital to this process. Look at, let's look at Romans 10. I mean, it's amazing. Romans 10, verse 9. And just so you know, if you are ready to give your life to Jesus... Let's, right here in this moment. Right here in this moment, you can do it. Because this, this is how he explains it. Verse 9, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. <laughs> For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. That's the righteousness of Christ right there. By believing that you are made right with God because of Jesus, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. And when you mean that in your heart and you confess it, and we're about to do water baptisms next Sunday, and if you are confessing that today, we want to help you walk with your journey and, and water baptize you after the 11 o'clock service next week. So, you know, be sure to sign up. It's another step of obedience, of following Jesus, confessing him publicly that he is your Lord and Savior. Now, that would be nice if the Holy Spirit did all the work, right? That's not, that's not what Scripture says. Isn't that fun? We got to read the whole Scripture, the whole Bible. Let's keep going. As the Scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They, are the, they have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Conviction of sin, here's an important takeaway. Conviction of sin only comes by the Holy Spirit. That is true. 
but very rarely does he work alone. He can, and he does, but rarely does he want to, rarely does he. He's showing up in people's visions around the world, but oftentimes there's seeds planted by believers playing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes it's not, and he shows up in a remote village in a vision, and then a believer confirms what he saw or she saw. The Holy Spirit loves to partner with you to save sinners from sin and death. The believer's responsibility is to declare and share the message of salvation and to leave the results in the Lord's hands as he speaks to hearts by his Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is working inside of us to convince as well. And I'm like, I was studying this. And I was like, how? I read that in a, in a, in a theologian's commentary and I, and I get it now. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't just come over you, but he lives in you. And now he wants to use you to testify through your testimony. And that's why it's so important that we're careful how we live. And here's why. Our testimonies can validate the truth of the gospel and what the Spirit of God is testifying to sinners' hearts. What do you mean, Ryan? Well, you know anyone who, cha- who was changed by Jesus, but you knew them in high school? We're walking billboards and evidence of God's power. We testify through our testimonies. And the Holy Spirit will help someone see, they'll help that unbeliever see. Remember Ryan in high school? He was a mess. Look at him now. (laughs) And when they talk to you, you're like, yeah, I mean, it's Jesus. I was lost, but now I'm found. We cannot convince people. This is what we're learning today. We cannot convince people of their sin, but nor has God left it for us to do. Thank God for that. Because I don't have three hours in a day to talk to how many people live in America and around the world. And then it doesn't even work. Because I'm not convincing enough. I'm not. But the Holy Spirit is. This work belongs to the one who is able to pierce and convince the heart of man. That's, that's who we need That's who we need in our witnessing. Let me read you this story from R.A. Torrey. He worked with D.L. Moody in his institute, in his college. He says this, at the close of an inquiry meeting, an evangelistic meeting in our church in Chicago, one of our best workers brought to me an engineer on the Panhandle Railway with this remark. This is what she said. I wish that you would speak to this man. I've been talking to him for two hours with no result. So I sat down by his side with my open Bible, and in less than 10 minutes, that man, under deep conviction of sin, was on his knees crying to God for mercy. The worker who had brought him to me said when the man had gone out, that is really strange. What is strange, I asked. Do you know, the worker said, I use exactly the same passages, same scriptures in dealing with that man that you did, and though I had worked with him for two hours With no result, in 10 minutes, with the same scripture, he was brought to conviction of sin and accepted Jesus Christ. What was the explanation? Simply this. For once, that worker, he he compliments his worker as one of the best. That worker had forgotten something that she seldom forgot. Because even the best, we can forget what we need to do, right? Even those who are experienced. He goes on to say, She forgot something that she seldom forgets, namely that the Holy Spirit must do the work. She had been trying to convince the man of sin. She had used the right scriptures. She had reasoned wisely. She had made out a clear case, but she had not looked to the only one who could do the work. When she brought the man to me, I said, I have worked with him for two hours with no result. I thought to myself, If this expert worker has dealt with him for two hours with no result, what is the use of me dealing with him? This is R.A. Torrey saying this. What's the point? If she couldn't do it, how am I going to do it? 
And then he says this, in a sense of utter helplessness, I cast myself upon the Holy Spirit to do the work, and he did it. Praise God. It's a, it's a humility, isn't it? After we've done our part, we surrender the results to the working of the Holy Spirit. But many have made the mistake to persuade, argue, make people feel guilty. Church, can I encourage you, do not try to make people feel guilty. That is not our job. We, we share the truth, but we don't rub it in people's face. This is what you're doing. It's disgusting. That's messed up. We never do that. That is not what Jesus would do, ever. That's us trying to force it. That's us trying to throw it down someone's throat. We're trying to do the Holy Spirit's work when we do that. Instead, we must humble ourselves, cast ourselves upon God to intervene. We do this by surrendering our human wisdom all of our fears, all of our worries that he's not gonna use us, he's not gonna use these words. We surrender that all to God and we say, Holy Spirit, use me, use these words. I'm not perfect, but take this delivery and make it pierce their hearts because only you can do it. What do you think I do? That's what I do. I don't remember, I mean, should we study? Should we pray? Absolutely. Should we know our word? Should we do our preparation? Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. But Lord knows when you go to talk to someone and an entire different conversation comes up, a need that you didn't realize was there or the Holy Spirit begins to work in a different way and you just have to trust the Holy Spirit. I cannot convince, but the Holy Spirit can. And we already know that not all will believe and receive Jesus Christ. Some will resist the Holy Spirit, but others will let the Holy Spirit work and they will be convinced, they'll be ready to repent and they will believe. So I just want you to remember today that the word conviction is not a bad word. It's a word of love, that God loves us. Even as believers, if God's convicting us, it's because he loves us. And I'll never get on the pulpit to try to purposely convict you. If I'm saying something that's convicting you, it's because the Holy Spirit is doing it, not because of me. I'm not studying your life to go, what could I say today that would get them? That is not me. I, I don't have time to be studying your life and do that either. I love you, but no one should ever think that or do that. Amen? I know sometimes... Because people, I remember being in a service one time and the pastor said something and I was like, was he like looking at my Facebook page or something? Like, you know, you know, he wasn't even my friend. That wasn't his fault. That was me. The Holy Spirit was hitting me. You know, be careful. You know, and I was like, you can, you, we can like deflect or we can accept, you know, what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. And so just, I just want you to rest assured that I'll never manipulate, I'll never try to do that, but be open to the Holy Spirit working in you. Because I know I do. I have to. So as believers, let him work and convict you and convince you that he loves you, that you're going to be okay. But if you're an unbeliever in this room, I want you to know something. The Holy Spirit's conviction, our last takeaway, the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin and of righteousness and judgment is the grace of God not wanting anyone to perish but to have eternal life. It's his love. It's God's love that he would say, you need to see that you're far from me, that your sin is gonna, you're destined to be away from me forever in hell. You need to see this. That is love. And only the Holy Spirit can pierce the heart in people more than what we can do in our persuasion or arguing. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit's role in this sinner's life one day, helping me see how far I was without Jesus. Can we close our eyes and bow our heads?
I'm going to pray for a few things. For those who are feeling the Holy Spirit opening your eyes and your heart to see your need for Jesus, do not delay. This is the grace of God moving upon you to receive Jesus as the forgiver and the forgiveness of your sins, the payment for your sins. He's also going to call you to a life of surrender and serving him. Just so you know, it's called lordship. He's calling you to follow him with your whole life. To make him lord of your life, leader, teacher, guide, all those things in your life. So he's not just going to save you from your sin. He wants to show you how to live for him in a devoted way. Open your heart to him today. And tell him, I see my sin. You can even pray this right now. I see my sin. And I see your grace and love. I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve the grace of the cross. I don't deserve eternal life. But yet you shower this upon me through Jesus. You generously provide your love and your forgiveness for me. And I accept it. I believe it, and I say that you are Lord of my life. I confess you as my Savior and Lord. And I give you my life today to follow you all the days of my life, to serve you, to worship you. Change my heart in that way. Church, he's doing it right now. I sense him doing it right now. For those of you who have believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you let him be your Lord now today? Would you say, Jesus, I will serve you with my whole life. I will give you my heart. I will give you my all. I've accepted your forgiveness, but I haven't owned up to living for you yet. And now I live for you. I choose to worship you with my life. When you pray this prayer, the spirit of God comes in you, cleanses you, makes you holy and righteous and adopts you. You're adopted and you're now a child of God. You are saved. God, we thank you for this work taking place right now. And Lord, for us as believers, may we see how real it is. May we be so, may we be so aware of the needs around us. And God, may we be led by your spirit to be witnesses. God, use us as we are. Lord, We don't have eloquent speech and rehearsed lines, but we do have your word and we have our testimony. Lord, use us. I pray, God, that we'd be willing to be sent, that we would step out in faith and share Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross and the grave and how we get eternal life through faith in him. God, give us the boldness to share. And Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the work you're doing in this community. For those watching online, those who are in this place, we thank you, God, for what you've done in our lives. And we leave here as a light. God, we even uh, worship you with our giving today. Take our giving, Lord. May you be honored and glorified in our generosity towards you because you've been so generous to us. Lord, may we leave here with power, power to serve you, to worship you and to tell everyone about Jesus. We love you, God. We thank you for souls being saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God.